welcome to Growing E-Commerce. I'm your host, Mike Ryan of Smarter E-Commerce. Today, we're joined by Marcus Haran. He's a colleague of mine at Smarter E-Commerce, and he has a background in companies like Hofer, which is the local brand of global omni-channel giant Aldi. His expertise is in programmatic display and YouTube advertising, among other things. Marcus talks us through the technology behind programmatic. He talks about use cases for e-commerce and how to view these campaigns. What's going on with the dichotomy between brand and performance? Is there a third way or a middle way possible here? What's going on with budgeting? Why are flights so popular in programmatic? And since we first recorded the episode, news broke that Microsoft and Xander have won Netflix's ad business. So we added a bonus question about that too. All right, let's get into it. So Marcus, thanks a lot for joining us today. Would you guys start with a quick intro? Um, tell us about yourself. What are your skills? What are some of the themes or topics that interest you? Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, really glad to be on, on your podcast. Um, yeah, my name is Marcus. Uh, at Mac, I'm responsible mainly for programmatic, but I'm also leading the analytics team regarding what, what is interesting for me. It's basically the whole online marketing topic. So I... Uh, started at SMAC as an account manager, so I also know a little bit about search ads and also shopping ads, of course. Um, before SMAC, I worked at, at Hofer, so um, I was also able um, to gather some social media experience, some influencer marketing experience, and I also did a little bit of SEO. There is a lot of different topics in this whole field of, of online marketing that I'm interested in and that are worth to, to talk about, I would say. Yeah, definitely. And for international listeners, um, Hofe is the localized brand for, um, or the trading brand here in Austria for Aldi, which is, um, you know, very, very large uh, grocer and online um, business out there. And so thanks for that introduction. Why don't, now that you've introduced yourself, why don't you give us a quick intro to programmatic? What's kind of the elevator pitch for that technology? Um, and I'm also curious where you see us in kind of the, the adoption or the life cycle of programmatic. Um, do you think there's a lot more headroom for advertisers to start using this technology or is, do you see it as getting pretty saturated? What do you think about this stuff? I think programmatic is a, a really interesting and an important technology because it enables uh, advertisers to have basically one tool where they can do a lot of their uh, online marketing activities. So programmatic basically gives you the chance to uh, buy display inventory through a large uh, number of, of ad exchanges. So it basically gives you the chance to show your display banners everywhere on the on the web. But not only display ads, you can also go for video ads, of course, but also yeah, the emerging topic of audio ads. There is a lot of stuff uh, up and coming um, from digital out of home. So basically, the more digital billboards there are in the in the cities and in the streets, um, the more reach you can uh, also get there with with programmatic advertising. Uh, more and more people use their their TV at home. Uh, they have a connected TV for for watching YouTube, for watching Netflix, for watching all the different streaming providers. Where you can also um, use programmatic advertising to show your ads there. So basically, I would say that that technology gives you the chance, um, yeah, to really have one aggregated view on on yeah display ads, video ads, audio ads, and um, yeah, you can serve them basically on every device that's somehow connected uh, to the internet. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I also I already mentioned um, yeah some topics where I think they will have a bright future. So I guess the adoption for display is already pretty high. But when it comes to other formats such as audio ads, such as connected TV, digital out of home, and, and so on, um, the adoption at the moment is is rather low. Um, but I guess the, yeah, it will increase uh, dramatically over the next few years. And when we talk about Austria, uh, yeah, the display market is not yet really fully focused on programmatic advertising. I think there are a lot of other countries, if you look at the UK or the United States, where programmatic already plays a way bigger part here in, in Austria, but also in Germany, you still have a lot of advertisers directly booking advertising space with different publishers and yeah, not um, taking the chance to have this like 
holistic view on all the on all the campaigns. Yeah, so that that's really interesting stuff. So if we think about you know traditional <clears throat> advertising and media as being you know partly disrupted in the past by um, digital advertising and including these digital banners and so on. Now we're looking at something that's even then kind of reinventing that once more. So you've just, what you described, it's so, so fascinating, this reach where you can get right into people's homes, where you can reach people while they're traveling um, or underway or in the store or wherever. Um, <clears throat> so that's an amazing kind of reach that it offers. And then that, which is sort of this yeah, buzzword coming, but decentralized um, or distributed uh, approach to getting this inventory out there. And then also at the same time, then centralizing that through um, a single technology rather than dealing with all these individual publishers. It's, it's quite a cool story. Um, what are some of, you know, hearing that, it sounds like the, the positives are, are quite clear or what the value that might be. But what are maybe some of the negatives there? Um, I mean, I hear about fraud, or I, I often yeah, see, you know, stuff when it comes to display advertising related to bot traffic, fraud, um, related to how incremental is this, related to uh, with programmatic, that the cost structures are not that transparent. What do you have to say about some of these concerns? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think... Um that those concerns totally make sense. Um, I mean, you. I mean, there is a lot of reports on that and, and a lot of articles. Um, from my point uh, of perspective, uh, also here the, the right key is technology. So um, a lot of DSPs already um, have a lot of uh, their own fraud and um, yeah, invalid traffic uh, blockers built inside. But you um, you can also use a lot of third party tools. So actually, the technology here gets gets better and better to really detect fraud traffic and yeah, also keeps that away from your website. I mean, of course, there is always the the chance that there is fraud traffic. Obviously, there is bot traffic, um, and with every technology getting better, also the people uh, trying to do it get better. And it's yeah. Uh, it's a game that 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 that's always going on, but I guess you have that for every part of online marketing because yeah, obviously the this fraud traffic and bot traffic can happen through all the different channels, and you just have to to yeah really have a look what different technologies out there to prevent that um, and make use of all the different um, technologies, providers, and so on that that. Um, have a look that you get the least least fraud traffic that uh, that you have the chance to. And when it comes to this whole in, in transparency things, I mean, also here, as we discussed before, there are so many different um, parties and companies uh, included in this whole programmatic uh, landscape that, of course, it's, it's not always like 100% transparent where everything goes because as mentioned, you can use different third-party tools to um, to detect fraud traffic. You can use a lot of different third-party providers for data. There are different ad exchanges included into one platform, so that makes the whole ecosystem, yeah, really big and complicated. And I think here also in the future, I guess that a lot of uh, things have to happen that it makes the, the picture a bit more clear that not only the, the agencies know what they are doing, not only the tech providers know what they are doing, but it's also clear for the, for the clients and for the, for the advertisers themselves, um, where actually, which percentage is spent of their, of their media budget. But yeah, it's, uh, the ecosystem consists of so many parties that it can get really complicated. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Whenever you see kind of some schematics of how this whole thing works and is set up, it's it's just mind blowing um, how, how connected this this all is. Um, okay, fair enough. Now <clears throat> I'm wondering, uh, yeah, and, and to your point that every channel is susceptible to this stuff. Sure, I mean in in paid search or wherever there's there's uh, you hear about click fraud there too, and there's people providing technologies or services there too. Um, so I. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. What about, like, how can we think about performance of programmatic? I mean, we've heard about uh, the reach and the placements that are available here. 
Um, now, you know, is this uh, branding or top of funnel only or what, what can, what ways can we see this through? How much can you drill that down or can you make that uh, more product specific, for example, can you make that um, just more intentful in other ways? What can we do to measure it? How do you view performance? You can do so many different things and with, with, with all those different things you can set up within programmatic advertising, it also gives you the chance to not only book upper funnel campaigns, but also set up all types of other campaigns. So I would, I would definitely not say that it's limited to, to this branding upper funnel campaigns, but you also have the chance to, uh, to do prospecting mid funnel campaigns, to do retargeting lower funnel campaigns. So there are a lot of, of, of opportunities. I mean, obviously if uh, for example, go for connected TV or digital out of home, it, it has more of this, this kind of branding um, view. But when it comes to video and especially display, uh, I guess we can agree that you have a lot of different uh, things you can do. You can play around with a lot of data sets. If you have set up the tracking in a nice way, you have a lot of first party data that you can use. So you can basically do really, really granular remarketing campaigns. You can also use your uh, first party data to set up similar audiences to reach statistical twins of your top converters and so on so uh, yeah um, from the from the top of the funnel until down to the to the lower funnel um, you have all the the chances to um, to set up things you can of course also set up for example dynamic remarketing uh, within programmatic so that's I would say a clear uh, performance channel um, but you can also um, Try to push your products, your categories, your slogans, whatever, to potential new customers. And also, if you, for example, look at Display and Video 360 from Google, there are a lot of different bidding algorithms already. So you, back in the days, it was like the CPM you 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 went for, but now you can go for maximize clicks, maximize conversions, or you can even set up your completely own bidding. So there's a custom bidding solution where you could say for users that already bought something, I want to bid higher than for other people or the other way around. And it gives you a lot of chance to really adjust the bidding to your business goals. So yeah, if you, if you want to use programmatic as a performance channel, you, you have all the chances too. Well, since we've got that word uh, performance um, I'm lingering there in our minds, I, I'm wondering about... Um, Performance Max is newer campaign type from from Google Ads, um, and you know they're kind of touting this or adver or yeah promoting this as a way to capture <clears throat> all of Google's ad inventory um, from one campaign type in this fully or highly automated way. Um, so talk to me like what what are some what are some of the differences here? Is there a difference in terms of the like how much is the the ad inventory overlap? Are there is there a lot of unique inventory still out there from programmatic? Um, what do you see as kind of like the pros and cons or the differences? Would you keep your programmatic campaigns running? Would you switch to something like Performance Max? What what what's the guidance here? I would directly turn programmatic off. No, just just, just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I, and go uh, on holiday. I, I've, heard that, <laughs> I've heard this recommended from Google reps before. Tur tur yeah, yeah, turn on Performance Max and go on vacation. <laughs> exactly. No, I mean um, the the Google uh, Display Network is obviously the the biggest one um, and get a lot of reach with that. But it's only one out of hundreds of ad exchanges that you can use with programmatic advertising. So that's that's the first thing I would say here that the yeah, the inventory, the reach is still different because you cannot reach all the placements that you can go for with programmatic advertising. That's the, the first thing. I mean, um, the, your your ads are kind of automatically served through all the different um, Google channels. But with programmatic, you could, for example, also set up so-called deals. So if you want to be present on specific websites because you know your your users are there, your potential new customers are there, 
that, for example, something you can only do within uh, programmatic advertising, as well as um, through all the other ad exchanges, you might get way better placements. So there, there are a lot of uh, advantages. You have more targeting options through this whole uh, third party providers. And moreover, I mean, this whole automated approach is, of course, nice because uh, with responsive display ads and so on, everything is set up automatically. Um, but if you uh, look uh, at brands that have a really, really um, yeah, strict guidelines when it comes to, to design, also with programmatic here, you have the chance to really, really um, set up your own dynamic uh, display ads have all the different design elements, all the logos set in the right space, all the colors used in exactly the, the right way. So these are the, the two or three main points, I would say that uh, why you should keep <laughs> keep on, on thinking about programmatic because um, yeah, you have a lot of possibilities to really push your nicely looking self-programmed <laughs> uh, banners through so many different ad exchanges um and yeah that's uh well, i would say almost, a big big advantage it, it almost sounds like you're implying that pmax assets are ugly <laughs> <laughs> i would never say so <laughs> not not well google's listening anyway no um yeah so it sounds like there's some very clear you know from the all these additional um placements that are available in terms of yeah the ad inventory that can re be reached also when we're talking about stuff like digital out of home or places that are not served um and then also yeah the control and the customization so performance max you know is a way of you know it's offering you some coverage of these of of display inventory and um they've got some really cool audience signals that they take care of for you with their dynamic prospecting and stuff like this um but in in end effect i get the feeling that it's just more or less for for beginners um that there's something much bigger possible here with programmatic i i would also say so i mean for me as a as a fan of of display advertising it's a uh, it's nice that more and more advertisers also through pmax start doing uh, display campaigns because it's included um, somehow and I think it's a nice chance to to see how well display ads can perform and uh, maybe in some weeks months years it also opens yeah the chance to to do programmatic campaigns and um, really focus on different types of creatives uh, different new formats and so on um, so I would also say yeah it's a it's a nice entry point to display ads if you want to uh, to go the next steps, um, you can always call me. So, Marcus, uh, um, I'm I'm a stranger in a strange land here. You know, I'm I'm really not that deep into programmatic. So, excuse a naive question here. If we see this this performance potential um, <clears throat> in programmatic, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that a lot of advertisers approach programmatic in flights with these kind of yeah campaign based um budgets yeah basically these periodic budgets um event like budgets in a certain regard so maybe you could help me understand why why is that is that a legacy thing or is there a reason why people don't budget more continuously or just have some kind of always on uh, budget i think it it comes from the from the classic media booking media agencies because I don't know if you launch a new website if you launch a new product range um, then you you go for tv ads you go for radio ads and so on and that approach was kind of taken into programmatic because it basically was the next step from this what I what I talked about before calling different publishers and saying please I want the space on your website and um, I want to have I don't know 100,000 impressions and I'm going to pay X euros for that. And yeah, programmatic took that to the next step because you could uh, handle a lot of different uh, publishers in, in one tool. And that's why from, at least from my perspective, this whole flight topic was always um, on people's mind when, when thinking about programmatic, but also, um, as I already mentioned before, um, things change and it's not only about impressions and CPM anymore, but also um, different algorithms uh, were included in the, in the, in the platforms. 
So from my point of view, it totally makes sense to um, not think of, of flights. I mean, obviously, or, or it also makes sense if you release a new product to, to make a flight or to spend more budget, but it totally makes sense to go more in the direction of, of always on campaigns because the more data the algorithm has, obviously it learns and it, it keeps getting better and better. And also here, Programmatic gives you a lot of um, chances to use that. As I already mentioned before, dynamic remarketing, but not only remarketing, you can set up a lot of different dynamic banners. Um, you can change products, you can change categories, you can switch basically everything uh, in your banner on in a data-driven way if you want so. And if it's connected with the algorithm, um, yeah, the, the campaign performance will keep be getting better and better. So um, I think that's that's one thing we will see in the next years that more and more advertisers will switch more into this direction of always on campaigns, having these dynamic banners in place um, that give them the chance to really update their banners on a regular basis that users don't see the same uh, display ad for, for a year. Because obviously that also wouldn't work. But with this whole data signals we have, we can um, change the banner set, do a B testing and let the algorithm learn and learn and learn. Yeah, so kind of helping to automatically solve against ad fatigue and automatically solve toward A-B testing creatives and stuff like that. Um, makes a lot of sense. So for, for e-commerce businesses in particular, is there anything else that we should, that we should know here about um, programmatic as it pertains to retail e-commerce um, and, or, you know, what are the most advanced or attractive applications out there? Um, or maybe you can tell us more about some of these placements that you were discussing earlier, some of these kind of less um, tapped or, or less discovered placements so far. From a, from an e-commerce perspective, for retailers that have a lot of product, it totally makes sense to automate um, and uh, dynamize as, as, as much as possible here. Um, and you can also do that within programmatic advertising with those dynamic creatives I uh, was already talking about. Depending on how well this uh, thing is programmed, it can it can really automate a lot of your stuff. Um, we are doing that a lot in the in the last few months and years, um, because it gives you the chance to connect your your data feed, your product feed with a display ad, and um, not only use that for for remarketing but also for dynamic prospecting. So to really um, show your most relevant, your most unique your best performing products to potential new new clients it yeah it takes a lot of time to yeah to set up new <laughs> display ads or to set up new ads all the time and um, you can automate here a lot with with um, yeah with connecting everything with your product feed and it gives you a lot of um, a lot of possibilities to split up your feed into i don't know manufacturer category and and so many more things or to specifically put uh, products with, I don't know, a, a certain label that you gave it in, in, in your feed. And that's what makes a lot of sense for, for retailers, of course, because um, it gives you a chance to easily handle thousands of products uh, if you want to. But it also gives you the chance to use your data signals that you got with your, let's say, lower funnel or mid funnel campaigns also for your uh, upper funnel campaigns because the more data you collected already you can use that for um, optimizing things but also for setting up the similar audiences so that mm -hmm. also your like more upper funnel more branding uh, campaigns are not just sent out to everyone um, but are also have more smart targetings and um, also send the your, your your creatives to the to the, to the most fitting people, I would say. It's, it's really interesting hearing you say this stuff. And I, it's just a, I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, but I feel like this term programmatic feels already outdated in a certain way, or like and you, you've discussed how, depending on how well programmed something is. And then on the other hand, um, we, you know, it implies a, like a, a plan and a design and a program. And, you know, we see a lot of technology um, moving toward something that's kind of implicitly programmed or where the machine is programmed to learn, this machine learning, this artificial intelligence. And I think that those elements are 
um, already at play here and increasingly coming to bear. But maybe because we're getting short on time, maybe you could just wrap us up with where is this technology headed in your opinion? What's what's next for a programmatic? I think that it depends on on the country we are talking about. As said, okay. I think the German the German speaking market um, the next steps is probably a, a higher adaptation to uh, using programmatic for. Mm. Uh, a more holistic view on your display campaigns, on your video campaigns. In, in other countries, if we look at the UK, for example, the adoption of programmatic is already really high. So I think there the next steps um, are, are clearly that you include more and more channels in your in your programmatic campaigns. This topic of media consolidation is a is a really important one that's that's uh, always mentioned. I think when big uh, streaming portals like Netflix will open up for advertising that's also be uh, going to be a huge step because now people watch of course a lot of uh, youtube on their tv but i guess the rest is netflix amazon prime and disney mm-hmm. plus and how these big streaming services are called um, but i guess that from if netflix start with it also more and more other uh, providers will follow and you also get the chance to um, yeah, to to place your ads there and then it, it gets you more and more reach in this whole field of, of connected to tv so i guess that's going to be a huge step also of course audio campaigns the the number of free users on spotify <laughs> is still <laughs> higher as most people think and you can also place your ads there and um, for example really uh, increase reach of your of your radio campaigns to for example, younger people that don't listen to classic radio anymore. So there, there are mm-hmm. a lot of things I, I think that are that are coming up. I think display is in some countries already pretty far when it comes to adaption. Uh, video has a lot of a, a lot of potential with this whole connected TV, and um, also in the future will be possible to book TV ads via programmatic. Or it, it's already in in, in some parts. Um, you have this digital out of home topic. Maybe in the future, I'm, I'm always uh, waiting for uh, that dynamic video is coming a bigger topic that you can also include your, your product feed into video. Uh, it's, a, it's a really tough topic. People keep talking about that for the last few years, but it's mm-hmm. not much happened so far. But I guess in the future, we will also see more adoption here. There are a lot of possibilities and, and chances for programmatic advertising, which I'm, I'm really looking forward to. Um, thanks for sharing that all. Uh, I'll just add a couple of things that just bubbled up in my mind while you're speaking there. Like, uh, I mean, Netflix, uh, this is for sure a very juicy steak. People are excited about that. Uh, Disney Plus, I think that, I think Disney, if I'm not mistaken, they've had some interesting job listings lately. It seems like they're building this technology um, by themselves. Um, Whereas Netflix, it appears that they're looking for someone to partner with. Um, They were speaking with like Google and Comcast lately about this. Um, But also, um, oh, hold on. (laughs) Um, Oh, yeah, this dynamic video topic. I mean, I think you see some of that speaking of Performance Max again. You see some some dynamic video on Performance Max. Um, It's or maybe you would define it differently. I'm not sure, but uh, not, not that well liked so far, not that well received. Is that what you have in mind or? I mean, there are more and more formats also on on YouTube where you can basically connect your merchant center feed, your product feed Mm -hmm. with, and it shows uh, some products next to your video. But what I more meant with dynamic video was that, it's really a video that is specifically programmed for that again so that you for example i don't know have a at at the end of your video have a a guy standing there holding a product and with just uh, some minor changes in your in your connected data sheet you can change the 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 product he or she has Mm. in 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 the hands so that would be nice and to have really i don't know a a product slider that i can include in my video and change that on a daily basis and stuff like that so there, I think there is still um, a lot of potential. So videos, okay. uh, products next to videos, we also we already see that a lot, actually. But really dynamically yeah. inside the video, mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to that. 
Yeah, I got you. I mean, I think if like if you've seen some of this crazy image generation AI that's coming out lately, a lot seems possible now. Um, so who knows when they're applying that to, to video as well. And I, I always have to think of my minority report. If you know this movie a while back now, Tom Cruise, with the augmented reality, everything's dynamic. Um, I'll talk about digital out of home. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think I got to let you go um, now, Marcus. So, uh, before before you go, um, any any people, products, things, anything that you want to shout out, or where can we find you um, online? Yeah, if you have any questions or uh, want to challenge everything I said today, uh, <laughs> don't hesitate and and um, yeah, uh, write me on on LinkedIn, um, Markus Harand, I guess uh, Mike will. Uh, put my profile somewhere in the in the show notes and um, I'm always open for a discussion and yeah thanks for having me today it was a pleasure to to talk about programmatic to to share some of my insights and yeah hopefully um, we see more and more programmatic adoption here in Austria um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to all the new stuff that's coming up yeah, definitely. I can I can really feel the enthusiasm. And yeah, Austria, the little programmatic train that could. Let's let's go, Austria. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's my job to say thank you very much because I really appreciate you coming on here. And um, yeah, really glad uh, to have you. So, Marcus, um, we're adding on a bonus question here because since we recorded this episode, um, there was a big headline, and that's that um, Microsoft got this deal with Netflix to basically help them. Uh, on the technology side and on the sales side for their advertising offer, which if I understand that's going to roll out in some select markets in early 2023. So probably some big metro areas, you know, maybe LA, New York in, in the U S and maybe some international markets too. Let's see. What do you make of this news? Were you surprised? I was actually pretty surprised because I, yeah, I didn't think of uh, reading uh, Microsoft on those headlines. But actually, if you if you read through the articles and um, yeah, the name Sander pops up in, in in every article, then of course it it totally makes sense um, that those um, partnered because Sander was acquired by Microsoft a while ago. So yeah, yeah makes makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when I when I saw the the news about the Sander acquisition last December, I think. I mean, I thought it was interesting, and I think I had a couple more articles open in tabs, but it, <laughs> that I never re really got to um, because it was hard to tell what would really be the significance there. I mean, they've got a strong like connected TV offering, right? And you think, okay, maybe something here. Xbox has got, uh, it's gonna be Microsoft has got good gaming credentials, and then Xander, there, there could be something here. But uh, for me, Netflix, this came out a bit out of the blue. I thought it was really, really cool win for Microsoft. The other day, you, you, you were mentioning that um, actually you can see Xander in Google DV360, for example. So, I mean, this this whole thing, programmatic, it's all this, it's all these massive demand side and supply side platforms, and it's all connected in different degrees. Of course, that's where these network effects and possibilities come from. So, what does that mean? Does that mean that we might be able to buy um, Netflix inventory through? Google or or what do you think that different options might be? How how could this look? To be honest, that are of course all speculations at the moment, and it could be that the inventory is exclusive to the Sander DSP. M might be, but um, yeah, I've I've also re read through some discussions on the internet, and um, could be or it's, it's it's really realistic that you can also buy the 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 inventory through other DSPs. So that would of course be great because you could reach the 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 Netflix inventory through a lot of different platforms, which would be great. Um, and now then we just have to see if there are probably like some special treatments for the Sander DSP or from for Microsoft itself special targeting better inventory if the first they get the first inventory there is available and so on that's going to be interesting and also it's going to be interesting if you can set up some kind of deals with netflix so if you're not using uh sander but let's say db360 from google if you can set up like special targetings to only show your ads for 
specific uh, kind of series, let's say sitcoms or stuff or stuff like that, so that mm -hmm. you can really yeah adjust your ads to 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 the to the environment where they are served. So uh, Microsoft and Xander will be kind of seated most closely to all that contextual data and, and stuff like that, and then we'll have to see. I mean, um, a friend of mine, or let's say online acquaintance of mine, uh, Tony Zara, he he mentioned um, also on LinkedIn that uh, when I was chatting with him about this too, and he he was mentioning that on the flip side, you know, there might be kind of an antitrust case here where they they have to make this stuff pretty open because we even see that YouTube inventory might be going to other DSPs in the future due to pressure from regulators and the, all the scrutinies that, that's out there. So it might just be a smart move. I also think Microsoft has kind of, they're like, oh, I saw the best phrase. Someone described them as, oh, the the cuddly monopol monopolist. Um, and because, yeah, they're one of big tech and they've they've had some monopoly claims thrown at them in the, in the past. But I do think that they're they're a lot cuddlier and friendlier now than they were in the past. I mean, for, for, for Microsoft, of course, it seems like a, a really nice deal. And um, also, I think what you're saying is completely right. I don't know if the YouTube inventory will ever be available through other DSPs. I mean, at the moment, um, they are still promoting it as a USP from DB360, the only DSP where you can uh, get YouTube inventory. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, if that's going to be changed, but maybe if the if the law is is going in that direction they have to but also when you um when you look at the other possibilities of netflix uh, which they could have partnered with all of them have already a, a big uh, video deal or their own video platform so um that's of course in the, the interesting thing for for microsoft because they now also have their um, their specific video uh, platform where they have premium inventory because Google obviously has YouTube and I read through a lot of other DSPs. They also have, all, basically all of them have some kind of exclusive inventory. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's a totally nice deal for Microsoft to have Netflix, uh, this big name in their portfolio. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, at a time of recording, the, uh, which is right now, this little update, we're recording July 21st and uh, Earnings reports just came out um, for uh, Netflix, I think, like yesterday. And I mean, in a nutshell, they they stopped the bleeding the, in terms of the subscription loss and so on. And, you know, this whole advertising thing was an impulse from the previous quarters, um, bad or tough results where we're seeing loss. And um, but it seems like they've stopped the bleeding and it's still the biggest platform out there. So now they've got to look for ways to further monetize the platform, like through advertising and maybe on the flip side, offer that that value to uh, subscribers with a cheaper subscription offer, offer supported by ads. Let's see how many people will take up an offer like this. I bet a lot. Um, and then, you know, they're also cracking down on subscription sharing and things like this. They're testing that out. Um, I think in a in a South American market right now, I don't I can't remember the details, but they're they're testing this out a little bit um, where you know you can now sign up for a single sub subscription or sign up for a household and they're trying to control this way. But that's tricky because people got used to free password sharing and stuff and and they never had a problem with it. And then the genie's out of the bottle and it's tough to walk walk that back once it, once you offer that for free for so long in end effect free. Yeah, but let's see. Maybe this um, this whole opening for advertising could be uh, yeah a good call on that because um, yeah. if obviously some people are not willing to to pay the ten or fifteen euros, maybe they are willing to to watch some ads, um, and that could be big solution to to the, besides uh, yeah following people and really having a look if people are sharing their passwords and so on because. That's also have has been announced quite quite often in the past that they're gonna be uh, way stricter with that and yeah let's see maybe with these two solutions in place could be um, could be an, uh, a good argument and mm -hmm. I think what what's also interesting is that uh, also other um, big platforms for example Disney Plus are uh, opening up for ads so um, that of course means a lot of additional advertising space for programmatic for connected tv so that's actually yeah it's 
it's going to be really interesting um, to to see maybe programmatic as really big competition to ads on on classic TV with all these uh, streaming platforms opening up. If there's already some kind of selection bias just in by virtue of who chooses this subscription model, you know, are those bargain hunters then? Um, by default, everyone who opts into that, uh, are they, um, you know, are they people who don't mind advertising that much um, as much as some others? It'll be interesting to see how this audience uh, looks in the end. Hope that uh, that these few thoughts though were, were interesting to the audience and thanks again and um, really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Growing E-Commerce. And if you enjoyed this podcast, Please consider sharing it with coworkers, friends, or within your professional network, Twitter, LinkedIn, Reddit, Discord. We really appreciate it. This podcast is produced by Smarter E-Commerce, also known as SMEC. To learn more, visit smarter-ecommerce.com. Mm-hmm.